Hello, uh, welcome to all of you who have joined us this afternoon. I'm imagining that you are joining from all over the country and perhaps all over the world. So thanks for making the time in your day to be here. Um, if you have not, if I've not had the chance to meet you, my name is Kate Boyle Ramsdell and I'm the president of the Society of Alumni. Um, and thanks, I, I love this work, I love the job and I love the college and I feel grateful to be here today with President Mandel. Um, today, you'll get a chance to hear from Maud, to get her perspective on campus life, on the implementation of the strategic plan, and then anything else she thinks it would be interesting for us to hear about. And after that, that'll take about 20 minutes of our time together. Um, we'll open up the floor to your questions. And just as a way of, of sharing how to do that, and we'll give you a reminder later, you can use the chat space as you are right now to say hello, to introduce yourself, to share comments. Um, or thoughts that you have about the conversation in general. But if you have a question, we're gonna ask that you put that in the Q&A function. Um, and then we will do our best to, to pull those out, tease them out a little bit together to have Maud answer as many as she can. Um, and then we will be here together until four o'clock, um, at which time we will close out the webinar. But it's such a pleasure to, to be here and to join you. And thanks again, Maud. Um, it's just so good to see you. So- You're doing well, thank you. Of course. Um, I know you have a lot of topics on your on your agenda, um, but the sort of one of the, the quick questions that we have for you is to give us a sense of what has happened on campus um, and what kinds of advice you were giving to our newest EAPs, the class of 2025, as they came to Williamstown um, in late August. That oh, be thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for being here, Kate. And thanks to the many, uh, nearly 300 of you now that are uh, chiming in and uh, uh, wiring in from all over the country and, and world. It's, it's always so wonderful how many uh, of you tune in to these gatherings together. Um, so I love that question. It's been such an interesting year. One of the things that I have said about um, uh, higher ed over the last two years is, you know, 2020 was a completely unprecedented year in that we sent students away from campus, which is not anything someone in a role like mine wants to do. And then last year was a completely unprecedented year uh, for all the reasons you all know. But in some ways, this year is also an unprecedented year in that we are uh, bringing people back. Um, well, we're not, at, we're at maybe 80% or 90% uh, of our normal um, operations. And yet there are still a lot of learning to be done and thinking to be done around um, some of the, uh, questions around COVID. And I'll come back to that. Um, I, I would really love to just say that for incoming students, particularly first years who are starting now, but um, this probably would apply to last year's class too, who we, uh, I heard one of them refer to themselves as a, a froshmore, which I thought was a sort of appropriate uh, turn of phrase for folks who started last year, but had a good experience in their own way, but very different from the standard first year experience. Um, it, and so many of these students are coming out of experiences which uh, weren't in person, sometimes for the entire year, sometimes for part of the year. So I've really been encouraging students that I've talked to to, um, to take a deep breath into the learning experience. And what I mean by that is, you know, it is so exciting um, to students, I think, to be in person again. Um, and they're really taking on a lot, right? It's like, doing everything all at once as fast as they can. And it's really exciting to see their enthusiasm. Um, but I also am really encouraging them to take a deep breath, to take advantage of some of the things that are in place this year, which allow them to, to take more courses uh, past fail if they want to, just that incoming first year class, uh, just for the first semester, uh, to ease back into the joy of learning. Um, they, they feel, um, I think, an intense sense that they have a lot to catch up on, which I completely appreciate. I have two uh, children myself, one who's in college and one who's finishing high school, and I understand that urgency to make up for, um, for things that were lost. Uh, but in some ways, taking a deep breath and enjoying the, the magic of learning um, again in this in-person environment is really um, to be, I think, appreciated and indulged in. And I'm hoping that, that folks are that really taking advantage of that. Um, and we do this at a time, and I'm just going to give everyone a little bit of an overview of what's happening broadly on campus, and then maybe I'll talk a little bit about COVID, uh, and then we can turn to some of your questions. Um, I know there are alumni piping in, there are parents. Um, many of you have heard uh, about work we've done uh, in William's strategic plan last year and some of the broad themes of, that we're working on on campus. 
Um, and I, I wanted to start with those um, because as much as we are navigating COVID, it's really important to, I think, make clear that we are also very much thinking about the strategic future for this college. Um, and we're doing so by really, uh, on the one hand, building on the tradition of academic excellence that this institution is known for, while simultaneously thinking very hard about what students need in today's world, in this moment they're graduating into, uh, in order to be successful. And the strategic plan as a result really looks at all parts of the college, all uh, corners um, to say, over the next 10 years, what do we want to move forward uh, in order to ensure that we continue to offer that excellence, but also uh, meet students where they are right now. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing right here. And I know many of you've heard me talk about it. You can also read it online. It's now visible um, and folks can, uh, can take a look at it. But I did want to mention a few initiatives that are underway. Um, both in the academic space and outside. So first focusing on academic excellence. Uh, we have three areas we're really targeting as part of the initiatives we're working on. Um, the first is in um, digital, what we're calling the digital liberal arts, which is really about data science, um, but also thinking about how uh, students can learn data science in a liberal arts institution? What are the ways in which science and technology come together? Uh, and what are the ways a liberal arts college can support that interdisciplinary learning in a way that is, um, uh, I think, kind of distinctive to our small learning environment? Um, and by really strengthening and developing our offerings in computer science and statistics, uh, uh, but also in science and technology studies, which gets us to think about how to use data ethically, how to um, think about uh, machine learning and AI in, in the world that we live in. How do we translate um, data, uh, sort of big data to humanities uh, approaches um, and bring them together to forward learning uh, out in the broader um, in the broader world and to and really to position our students to be successful uh, wherever they go using data uh, to to make the arguments they're going to need to make um, and in whatever professional paths they choose. Uh, we're also really expanding our vision um, of the integrative arts as a central component of students learning. And here we build on a long tradition of Williams uh, strength in the arts. Uh, and in the Berkshires, where there is a just enormous array of arts institutions that have um, expanded and grown over the last 20 years. Uh, and Williams seeks both through um, repositioning the Williams College, College Museum of Art, but also thinking of our larger integrative arts program uh, as um, ways in which we can support students to do uh, this work and to integrate it into their uh, education. And this is really because um, creativity is a central component of a liberal arts education, along with research and writing and data and science, as I just talked about, solving problems. Um, we want students to, to, to be creative and to channel that creativity into every endeavor. Uh, and so, for example, uh, we have so many classes now across the curriculum, yes, in art history, but also, for example, in chemistry or environmental science that use uh, materials from the art museum in their courses. And that's just one example of the ways we do this integrative work. Uh, we're also um, doing uh, to move away from the academic side of the shop and talk about financial access and affordability. There's a big emphasis in the plan on supporting um, the strength of uh, the access and affordability for which Williams has become quite well known, um, but also to think quite hard, I think, about middle income students who in some ways uh, have been uh, more left out of some of the um, financial aid initiatives that many schools have pushed over the last uh, 15 to 20 years or so. Um, and as part of that, um, we're really uh, thinking about what are the, the pain points for middle income families who sometimes don't even apply to institutions like Williams because they, they think it's out of reach. Uh, and here our emphasis has been um, on growing our support over the summer uh, for students so that students are relieved of their summer earnings requirements, which um, particularly are challenging for middle income students who typically have a larger uh, summer earnings requirement um, and growing our capacity for affordability in the middle class area by funding the full range of opportunities we see as essential for a Williams education, including uh, faculty led academic and co curricular projects. So that's another area where we put um, a, a big emphasis uh, as well in these um, uh, in the strategic plan um, and 
that I, I'll use that to bridge to talk to just about two other areas I wanted to call attention to um, in my opening remarks here. Um, one is the space of uh, career exploration career exploration and community engagement. And for those of you who look at the plan, I think you'll see a big uh, emphasis on thinking about the 12 months of a Williams education rather than the sort of traditional way colleges organize learning, which is two semesters. Uh, we certainly do that and continue to do that. Um, but we're also really thinking about the four years that a student is with us. How can we really use those summers well for engaged learning? How can we use winter study very well for, um, for the, that learning as well? Uh, by offering hands-on learning experiences. And we, we already do this well at Williams through um, many, many uh, hands-on scientific uh, partnerships between faculties and students to do uh, in research over the summer. But here, and you'll see a, a resonance with what I said about the arts, uh, we're looking to explore um, greater, building out greater internship opportunities in the summer in the arts and in other endeavors in the humanities and social sciences, as well as in the science fields, so that students can blend together thinking and doing, that they can, and this uh, really, I think, goes back to some of the things I was saying about preparing them for the world they're going into, which is um, very quickly uh, moving students into um, activities where uh, having um, dirtied their hands, as it were, uh, in, in real um, engaged learning opportunities uh, is very helpful as they move into the next phase. Uh, and so we do this um, by thinking about the 12 month arc of the year um, and building out opportunities for, for students in these uh, periods um, when they're both that link the classroom work to the outside the classroom experience and in these periods where they're not doing academic work as well. Um, and uh, this is linked, I think, to a broader view in general about um, bolstering the co-curriculum uh, at Williams and thinking about all the out-of-classroom learning that goes on for students uh, in dorms, in, on athletic fields, in uh, CLIA, our Center for Learning and Action, uh, in the um, theater, all the places where students do uh, learning. And we all know, I know those of you who are alumni or even uh, parents who are alumni from other institutions will say that a lot of the learning takes place uh, from other students outside the classroom. Um, and so we continue to think about how to strengthen those learning opportunities, uh, maybe not as this a highly a structured way as we do it in the classroom, uh, but nevertheless structuring it perhaps a bit more than we've done in the past. And, and one example I think I can give of that is the new TAPSI housing program, which supports students' interest around a particular theme or area of specialized interest uh, for a one-year uh, housing focus that is um, enhanced with faculty and staff engagement so that learning is built into the living structure. So this wouldn't be for first-year students Students, but for older students who are interested in doing this, uh, they can put forward a proposal as long as it is supported with faculty and staff uh, engagement to build out learning in the house. Um, and the first example of this this year uh, is the sustainability lab. So we have 25 students who are experimenting uh, with living together in Hubble uh, in a, one of these collective housing endeavors um, that brings together students from all classes interested particularly in sustainability uh, and spending the year living and learning together around that theme. Um, and this is a, a, a housing, as all of you know, is one of the ways in which colleges are con constantly um, experimenting and thinking about how to uh, develop and strengthen offerings in this area. And this um, learning living community, I think, is one that uh, we're very excited to uh, be experimenting this with this year to, to think about. Um, the very last part of the strategic plan I want to call to your attention before we move to your questions um, is one that uh, I really want to highlight. I, you all come to this conversation from uh, different levels of engagement with the college at different moments. So you may have tuned in at uh, various moments in the strategic planning process. And one of the questions I used to get a lot from alumni is, so where do we fit in the strategic plan? How do alumni fit in? Um, and I'd like to say, for those of you who haven't taken a look at it, um, uh, there is a very conscious engagement with thinking about alumni as part of William's strategic plan. And that's really because alumni are so important uh, to, the way, to the health of this institution. 
It is uh, an institution that's committed to lifelong learning, which means engaging and building out learning opportunities for alumni is part of what we do. But it's also uh, such uh, an important part of uh, the support we offer for students here, alumni engagement with current students uh, in various ways, uh, teaching in winter study or uh, taking part in a program for the cent Center for Career Exploration or engaging through um, EFLINK and uh, offering mentoring opportunities for students. And many students here tell me um, about how they pursued a particular opportunity or got advice from uh, an, uh, an alum uh, in ways that I think are sort of some of the special sauce that makes Williams Williams. And so uh, we are thinking about how to continue to can expand and grow our alumni partnerships for students, but also uh, between and among alumni um, and continue to invest in, in alumni uh, learning over time. So um, I think I'll stop there. There's a lot more in that plan. Um, I did want to turn just a moment to COVID on campus. And some of you may be curious and interested about that. I'm happy to say that um, I'm not spending as much time thinking about this as I once did. So I once thought about it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I still think about it an awful lot, um, but, uh, but happily the semester has gone very well. So, uh, we have a required vaccination on campus uh, for all faculty, students and staff. Uh, we have an indoor masking rule in administrative and um, uh, learning spaces, um, which students are really good about following. Um, and we have uh, a weekly testing protocol. And as a result of all three of those things so far, uh, we've been really successful this semester. We had some students with COVID when they first got here. Um, there's there's been no community spread. Uh, it's so far, we're at about a half dozen cases for the semester so far. Um, but uh, we know from other campuses that that can change on a dime. And so we're prepared to move the levers that we might need to move in order to uh, make things either more um, uh, uh, sort of more testing, more mask rules, uh, additional uh, uh, protocols we can put in place or fewer as the case may be as we go forward. And we've had examples of both already this semester, sort of clarifying travel policies on the one hand so that we ensure if students leave campus that they come back um, uh, with an eye to protecting the community, um, but also lifting what was originally a fairly locked down spectator rule for uh, indoor events and allowing uh, offices on campus to um, move forward plans to bring in spectators for certain events if they have plans in place for uh, vaccination and masking, uh, ensuring vaccination and, and masking. So, uh, so we're using these levers uh, in real time. Um, but there are other ways COVID has affected the campus, um, and I know some of the parents on here may even be poised to ask about some of them. Um, supply lines, um, thanks to the difficulties of uh, staffing, um, transit, trucking across the country have made certain um, uh, have caused certain problems for us uh, in uh, unexpected areas that we continue to work on. Um, difficulty in hiring in certain areas has uh, meant that we've had to um, take uh, certain steps in uh, dining, for example, that um, at the beginning were causing very long lines. We've made some adjustments to try to, to ease the problem. We do hear from students and parents uh, vocally about when it's not going smoothly. And I can assure you that uh, we're working hard to, to make adjustments in real time to, um, to uh, try to deal with the fact that there are some larger structural issues that are a little bit out of our hands. And so how can we do the best that we can in uh, the circumstances we're facing? Um, it has an impact on everyone. The faculty club, for example, isn't serving uh, food this year. Um, the president's uh, schedule, I can tell you, uh, of receptions and events at my house that I do for faculty, students, and staff is highly curtailed um, in large part in response to uh, to some of these these issues. So we're, we're, we continue to work on them and obviously look forward to a time where uh, some of the structural issues alleviate as well. So maybe I'll pause there um, and we can start talking, turning to questions, Kate, um, about the many things I'm sure people are writing in about. Sure, that's great. And if I've learned anything in the last year of doing this with you, people who have attended Williams ask very good questions. Yes. They're, not, they're not often easy, but um, okay. One, one is uh, from John Akroff who asks, you mentioned efforts to attract students from families for whom the price tag makes Williams seem out of the running. Right. Um, have any of these efforts yielded an increased acceptance rate for those students or even yield rate and also help to retain students? 
Oh, thank you so much for the question. Um, so I, I, I should note the we're sort of only beginning this work, I think. I mean, we, we've we done great work in the space of high need students. And so if the past is any indication, um, dedicated efforts and attention to attracting and retaining students from high need backgrounds uh, with the focus on uh, access and affordability that Williams has invested on has yielded great results. Uh, the focus on middle income students has really been um, uh, is something we've just started over the last year or two, and it has overlapped with COVID and other kinds of issues. So you may know, for example, that in COVID last year, we, we did an across the board tuition cut by 15% uh, to recognize the fact that um, some of the regular programming we do in an order, ordinary year, like winter study or um, uh, athletics or all, really, frankly, most of the co-curricular activities were, were highly curtailed. Uh, and so because of that, um, I'm not sure last year was the greatest uh, measure of what a, a standard year would be like, um, but we, we do continue to um, innovate in this space. And I, I do have high hopes um, that both uh, um, at the attraction and at the retention level, we'll, we will be able to make headway. Um, the summer earnings requirement, the one that I've mentioned, um, Williams relieved the summer earnings requirement for one year with a very open application process for a second year a couple of years ago. Um, we were the, actually the first school in the country to do that. And very quickly, Princeton did all four years uh, right after us. Um, and uh, and I, we had been sort of teed up to move in that direction. And I do hope very much that um, in, in short order, we'll be able to get there too, so that we can use those summers um, for all the learning opportunities that they provide for students. Um, and again, those particularly target uh, middle-income students. So uh, opening up those opportunities so people can take unfunded internships, not-for-profit work, or, or frankly, uh, many students still work anyway to, because they have needs to support and help their families, um, but it still allows them to, to do a greater breadth of opportunities over, over the summer. That's great, thank you, Maud. Um, we have a, a couple of different questions about connecting on campus and even people saying, how do I connect with my own child about his experience, which is very different from my own educational background. Yeah. Or um, a, a graduate, I think, who says, given the new norm, how are you personally staying connected to students? Oh, wonderful. How yeah. do you manage to do that? And maybe that falls under the broader umbrella of advice to to, to everybody else. <laughs> well, maybe yeah. I'm going to try to weave those together into a single answer. So first of all, I have a son in college um, and, you know, it's hard. <laughs> they, they get really busy and focused on their lives. Um, and uh, and I so I, I empathize with families that are trying to figure out uh, how do you uh, engage with them as they grow, the, spread those wings and, and move into really, uh, particularly post-COVID, I think, a, a, a whirlwind of activity and connectivity uh, in their own world. Um, and, you know, in some ways, we just need to let them do that. But uh, I, I will say that um, uh, to, we, to connect the two halves of the question together, um, meeting them where they are is very powerful. So last year was very frustrating to me. I was on campus the whole year in my house. Uh, anybody who tuned into a Zoom meeting with me last year would have seen my home office. Right now I'm in my Hopkins office, but I would have been in my home office. Uh, and so I was right on campus next to students and I had a, I basically could not engage with them in any useful way. But as the spring, as the spring sprung, I, I started to meet students on my porch. Uh, in modest ways, but it was challenging. So this year, I've really gone back to what I've did in past years. I, in fact, just had lunch in one of the dining halls today. I try to do that every two to three weeks. I have open office hours. Um, students typically come to see me uh, without appointments for any number, just to say hi. I have I have folks who just show up um, to, to meet me. I have folks who come with a concern or a, a something they're upset about. I have folks who are, I like to call my frequent flyers, who come often and who are really interested in higher ed and how it operates. Uh, um, I even, I have some thesis students. So I, I tried, I, I did teach a class a couple of years ago and I do plan to do that again next year uh, and hopefully regularly after that. Um, but I have some students I work with as a result of, of that class um, in an ongoing way. So I try to, I try to get involved in what they're doing, um, not to mention go to you know, student performances, athletic uh, events, and the like, um, so that I can really engage with them where they are. So for parents, um, you know, there's no question that this can be challenging, uh, squeezing into their timeframes. They seem to be awake at 
night and asleep during the day if my son is any indication, but um, there are, uh, I think, lots of ways. Um, and one of the very specific pieces I, of advice I would give you is to ask them about something they are reading in a class. This was one of my great pleasures when my son started college. So it wasn't, how's your class? It was tell me about something you're doing in that class. A very well, you know, tell me about the first book you read. And I was so blown away by how much he had learned in uh, those first. For me, it was those first Thanksgiving conversations. Um, it was really exciting. Uh, it, it was almost astounding, actually. Um, so coming at it not so much from you know how was your week? Tell me about your 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 classes, but tell me something specific you've learned. You know, tell me something that was challenging for you this week. Um, telling me, tell me something that, uh, you know, really blew your mind. You can start to, to, uh, engage with them through their own eyes. Yeah, that's great. Maud. So a couple of people have, have written in with kind of status of project or status of program questions. Yeah. And the first one is from Bob Krauss, which is about status of the work with the Stockbridge Muncie community of the oh, yeah. tribe, including any work with the land acknowledgement. Yeah. Thanks for that. Great question. So, um, so one of the best things that happened last year at Williams, many, many very challenging things happened, but one of the very best things that happened was at the beginning of the year, we uh, in, signed a um, memorandum of understanding, an MOU with the Stockbridge Muncie tribe. The Stockbridge Muncie tribe is the tribe that um, traditionally had uh, their ancestral lands on the lands in this area where Williams is located and beyond uh, in this whole area and uh, who were displaced um, and ultimately um, moved to Wisconsin, uh, but have deep um, historical roots to the region. Uh, and so Williams signed an agreement with the tribe to move the historical part of the historical office here uh, into Williams, um, it, it's sort of a, it, it's William, it's Williams it's a Williams building but it's on Spring Street uh, where we provide the office space um, and they uh, staff it and it's their own um, it's not a Williams office but it is uh, a partnership and we also fund a number of internships by students who are working um, really fruitfully with the Stockbridge Muncie to do archaeological work in um, Springfield, uh, to do projects here on campus, to do historical work in the region. There are a couple of faculty on campus who are specialized in this area and who partnered with the students uh, and, and with the office. Um, so it's been a really fruitful way, um, a kind of uh, to use the language that we often use around this work, a restorative way to think about how do we move forward from the challenging history uh, that um, uh, ended up displacing um, these original inhabitants from this, from this land. Um, and I think students, a whole host of students from a wide diversity of backgrounds have been really interested in this work and engaged and, and have uh, from winter study and in the summer and during the academic year. Uh, as for the land acknowledgement, there was um, a proposal by the Committee on Diversity and Community last year, a long proposal on Williams history. It had many recommendations in it, one of which, which, uh, one of which was that Williams adopt a, a land acknowledgement. That's an institutional question, uh, and so uh, it is, a, is one that the board will uh, be taking up as part of its work um, in the year ahead, so I'll be able to circle back after um, after that moves forward, but uh, but it, it will be something that we consider. Thanks, Maude. The, ne the next question is actually about the status or sort of a, uh, the Gaudino Scholars Program and how is the college managing both the program, but just more broadly, this idea of experiential learning, which I think can be linked to another question here about a graduate from the 70s saying, you know, when I had winter study, we were always encouraged to go outside our area of most comfort and expertise. And how is the college experientially trying to do the same thing? Or is the college trying to do the same thing to broaden their horizon today? Yeah, I mean, the Gaudino legacy is is uh, profound here. I, people talk about it all the time. I'm, I am uh, often engaged with alumni and faculty who uh, think of that program as one of the tremendous legacies uh, of this institution. Um, as we continue to think about how to, to do that work moving forward. Um, you know, the, the broad answer to the question is I think lots and lots of courses um, engage students with uh, the complex issues uh, that um, take them out of, I think the language we use out of their comfort zone or engaging with challenging material. And, and um, 
I, I talk to students about that all the time and some of the work that is going on uh, in, the, in those classes. In expressly in the experiential learning, the, a lot of this work sits in one of two, well, th really three places. So the Center for Learning and Action through CLIA, which is CLIA, which is our uh, center that um, in the old days, you would have thought of this as kind of the public service center for students who wanted to do volunteer work in the community. But um, uh, it's much more accurate these days to think of those um, programs or as many of those programs as doing this kind of work that you're talking about, about placing students out in the community to do experiential learning. So for example, uh, in the local prison, we have faculty who teach courses in the prison uh, and bring students into those uh, uh, spaces to do learning. I, I had the honor of attending the graduation of one pre-COVID, but this is an ongoing program at Williams. Incredibly moving. Uh, I don't think there was a dry eye in the room at that graduation ceremony, including including my own. Well, that's not saying much. I, I cry pretty easily, but uh, but uh, but it was more fascinating to see the the students and the some of the incarcerated um, individuals with whom they had been working. And so um, so the CLIA and faculty uh, do. Um, work, uh, our program in public health takes students out into all kinds of communities uh, locally to do that kind of work. Um, and there are winter study trips uh, that also do, and in much the way you're talking about, um, take students uh, out of Williamstown, but into learning environments where they're exposed to um, diverse array of background sets of problems, um, whether they be environmental or sort of urban studies questions or other uh, other arenas. So I would say that that com commitment goes deep here. Um, and I'll just add that um, in the, I, I think I mentioned this, but in the strategic plan, there is really um, a deep commitment to expanding the kind of experiential uh, opportunities we offer, both in the type we're talking about and in as I mentioned, scientific arts, there's lots of ways in which experiential learning can be powerful. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Robert Patterson says, Williams has had a sound mind and a sound body emphasis always. Yes. So do varsity, intramural and other exercise activities fit into the strategic plan? And as some schools are starting to curtail their athletic and varsity programs, where is Williams in this set? Of oh, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because when I was trying to figure out what to include in my overview, I, I couldn't cover everything. And But this is actually um, a big theme in the strategic plan. So, um, so as you all know, those of you who are alum, alumni know the the mind body as you as you already worded this in your question um fusion is really important at williams and yes we have a robust varsity athletics program um, and other ways of engaging with um, competitive sports but we also have just a fantastic outing club, for example, and an amazing dance program. And, and then we have all the volunteer dance programs. We have these student groups that just, you know, on Mountain Day will be, will be um, climbing mountains, but you'll also at the picnic on the campus find students dancing for one another in these troops that are just amazing. Um, so I, I think it's actually fairly wound into the culture of the place. Of course, 40% of our students are varsity athletes. That remains a big part of the Williams uh, profile. Um, but uh, it is, I think, fair to say that a commitment to the, the mind-body connection and to, to really a deep belief that the brain functions better when the body functions better and uh, vice versa, as it, it is uh, a really a key part of this place. So the strategic plan, um, I would say, leans into that reality by uh, not at all uh, backing away from our commitments to our uh, athletic community, but rather uh, thinking about how we can do a better job melding um, uh, our commitments to integrative well-being, mental health, uh, with our commitments to physical health. Um, and that will include some you know, ongoing work to build up the infrastructure on the athletic side, but it's also about thinking about our PE requirement and the ways in which other kinds of investment in well-being uh, writ large um, uh, is very important. And it's in fact essential these days to build it in, not just to sort of how many therapists we have, um, but also uh, the skills with which we teach students in the residential halls to take care of themselves, uh, well-being defined broadly. Um, so I see these pieces as fitting together, and um, we will continue through the strategic plan to, to build those connections uh, and invest in, in, that, uh, in that area. 
That's great. A couple of people have written in about um, fossil fuels and divestment. Yeah. And I know this is something that you think a lot about. And so would love yeah. to hear your thoughts on where the college is. Yeah, I, I, I very much appreciate the interest in divestment. Um, and I know the college has heard from many uh, who um, who have profound thoughts about uh, this issue as well as what's going on at other schools uh, around it as well. Um, and um, you know, I take that that feedback seriously as we uh, as we continue to move forward. The history of Williams in this space has really to been to move away from extraction, that is pulling gas or oil out of the ground, and toward renewables. Uh, and other investments that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And our investment in renewables uh, and the transition toward renewables currently make up about 1% of our endowment, but we expect to grow that number further as the range and quality of opportunities continues to increase. So uh, um, five years ago, uh, actually, yeah, a little more than that now, the board uh, invested 50 million in sustainability writ large, including in this investment uh, in renewables, um, and we have now continued to meet that goal, but to continue to move forward um, in where opportunities uh, abound to grow and develop that as well. Um, and so uh, that's really been the emphasis at Williams, um, that is to increase our positive impact by investing in ways that support the development of markets for renewables and the transition to re renewables. Um, and to, um, of course, we don't have any direct investments in um, in the fossil fuel industry, but I know there is a tension right now and thinking about drawing down uh, the collective um, commitments at other schools uh, and Williams continues to, to talk about that as well. Um, so uh, we, we also talked about this a little bit earlier, the Boston Globe article this past weekend about efforts around legacy admission. And I know there are a couple of questions about admission in the chat, so I thought I would start here. Um, where I know that the, the alumni community is a broad range of opinions on legacy admission um, and how will this continue to play out at Williams? Yeah, so this has been an interesting one, legacy admissions, because um, it is, I would say, you know, some of you have heard me talk about the multivocal aspect of the Williams community um, or the cacophonous is my new favorite word. Um, uh, and, and legacy is one of these um, areas where there really is, um, uh, I would say, uh, an active conversation that goes on uh, in the alumni community. Um, I've heard a great deal. Of course, I read the Boston Globe piece uh, today. And in fact, um, I know well the student who is um, now alum from Brown University, who's the center of that story, who I knew when I was in my former institution. Um, uh, you know, Williams uh, has a legacy program. It has had one uh, for a very long time. We define legacy as a student who has at least one parent who's an alum. Um, and um, I think it is really important that people who are listening understand that um, our recruitment and enrollment goals reflect the college's long held belief that our students benefit from learning in an environment of peers who are intellectually vibrant and diverse across many dimensions, which means that um, when we consider an applicant, there's no one um, characteristic, including legacy, that uh, is the defining reason they get into or don't get into Williams. Um, the diversity of our community makes Williams a, a dynamic place to live and teach and learn um, and prepares our students to, to, we hope, make the wider world a better place. Um, and so then every student at Williams becomes much more than any single label um, or identity, I hope. And the admissions work is really rooted in an effort to understand them as multidimensional people. Um, so again, no student is ever admitted simply because they identify in one way or have one strength or one talent uh, or one uh, type of background. Um, but uh, we have consistently had legacy students at the college. Um, they, the, the number has stayed fairly steady over decades, um, I would say. It's a fairly small part of the admissions profile of the college. Um, and by no means uh, do all legacy who apply uh, earn a spot at Williams. It really has to be a, a, that strong component of um, qualifications that we look for in all our applicants. Thanks, Maud. Um, so this is a slightly different question. So the, the asker is wondering two things. One, if there are juniors overseas this year. Mm. The second is more related to sort of managing numbers on, of, of students on campus with housing and things like that. It's sort of the surge of students post-COVID. Yeah. Not post COVID, but after a lot took time off. How's yeah. that? 
so there are some students overseas. It's not, um, there's not a lot of study abroad uh, at the moment um, for all kinds of reasons, some of which has been well outside of Williams control. We were open to supporting certain kinds of programs if students uh, could find programs that were functional. Um, the most exciting thing is that both last year and this year, the Williams Exeter program has functioned. So even last year, uh, and it was a very hard year for Exeter. Exeter, they had COVID on our inside our little program. They had to manage it. Um, the faculty member, the hero, I would say, who's running that program last year and this year, Steve Swope, who's a member of our biology department, um, really had to do things uh, in terms of managing a, a study away program that no um, Williams director of Exeter has ever had to manage before. But um, they got through it. And in fact, I ran into some students earlier this last week, I think, who had been on the program at an event, um, and they were back and they just had didn't, they couldn't stop talking about how much they had loved last year in Exeter, despite what had really sounded like a very challenging experience. I think it really brought them together. Many of them were living together in a house uh, this year or in housing together this year. So they they bonded and continued that um, affinity uh, of, of experience and, and brought it forward into this year. So that was neat to see. Um, and uh, and this year it is running. And this year, it's not last year, they were all locked down. This year, they're not uh, locked down in the same way. Um, our, our Williams Mystic program is also now up and running. It was completely shut last year, but this year it's open uh, to, um, and that program attracts Williams and non-Williams students. That, of course, is a domestic study away program, but I can't help but toss it out into this audience because I'm so, so fond of this program. Um, we do have more Williams students there um, this year than I think we've had in years, and I think that's because study abroad is challenging. So some of these study away programs in, in the United States are, are surging, but that's a wonderful liberal arts program, and students uh, are taking advantage of that too. So we, we hope to get back to more uh, to sort of back where we were at some point, but obviously that follows uh, a context and, and so sets of circumstances that are a bit out of our control. Okay. So uh, Williams isolated rural location has historically been both an asset and a liability, this person assumes in attracting students or even professors, staff. Um, how how has that sort of evolved during COVID and how do you see Williams geographic location as a longer term factor in the life of the college? So speaking personally, I love the location of Williams. This is, I loved it from the minute I got here and it's only grown on me over time. It was a, not a terrible place to spend the last uh, uh, year and a half, I must say. Um, it, is, uh, it is, as you all know, um, a magical place, uh, but it is far from um, airports and train stations and urban centers. Um, and that can be a challenge, particularly uh, for faculty and staff. It's a problem often for spousal uh, or partner relationships or the opposite, that is uh, single individuals who come here and have a hard time uh, finding um, community or partners uh, here. So that, that can be a challenge. Um, and for students, of course, um, it's getting the word out to as uh, diverse a population as possible across the United States and across the world for, uh, and then attracting people to a corner of Massachusetts that may not be familiar to them. So it, it can work as, an, as a magnet of attraction. Um, it can also be a, a challenge. Um, and the, speaking about COVID, one of the really interesting questions, I would say this isn't just for Williams, but for higher ed in general, is to what extent we can help um, ease some of those challenges by offering more hybrid remote opportunities, not for learning. I think we are pretty committed to our in-person learning um, way of uh, teaching and, and delivering information here. Uh, but when we think about staff and partners, um, there are some opportunities that COVID has offered that we're continuing to think about. This is not without challenge. And I will say I'm trying to move a little more slowly and deliberately as we think this through um, than, uh, than some of the decisions we had to make under the heat of, uh, of COVID decision-making uh, because um, it, you know this is a residential liberal arts college. It means that being here in community together is important for students, but partly what makes it so special for students is uh, that faculty and staff are also engaged in the community here. So just really trying to be thoughtful about that while understanding that the hybrid realities, the flexible work opportunities that the world has now moved to um, does pose some, um, does provide some uh, opportunities for us 
uh, going forward. So um, really trying to think that through, learn from other institutions, both academic and non-academic, uh, and also watching those who did move faster, uh, sort of what kind of problems they're encountering um, out of the gate as we, as we think this through here a bit more. Yeah. One of my next questions was going to be about remote learning in the post COVID so that you touched on that, but another person's asked about this idea of the digital liberal arts and, and finds it really intriguing. Yeah. This in our data science visualization and are there any examples you can give that would touch on the area of climate change. Oh. Oh, so interesting. So, okay, I'm going to break this into multiple parts of the question. Yeah. So first, just on the question of um, learning. Um, I, uh, uh, the remote learning. So we are fully in-person and we believe that Williams should be a fully in-person learning environment. I think our faculty believe that. I mean, there are certainly some who are nervous about COVID, but beyond that, I think there's a deep understanding and commitment to the in-person learning experience. Our tutorial program emphasizes that. But I should say that we learned a lot during COVID about tech, the technology itself and the ways we can use it productively in, um, as a pedagogical tool in our classrooms. And that faculty, um, I think, will never go back. They, they, they are experimenting with those forms. They use them more. Uh, the language of higher ed is, you'll sometimes hear people refer to flipped classrooms where content is provided um, in, in, say, a video format, and then the in-classroom time is used for pro hands-on problem solving. There's, there's all kinds of ways that this can uh, be used, and I think lots of faculty have been experimenting that, um, and it's it's been powerful. Um, so that I do see having a lasting impact and a positive one uh, as we go forward. Um, in terms of um, thinking about uh, this other question, so there's been an, ex you won't be surprised to know, an explosion of interest in, uh, in environmental studies, uh, climate work. Um, it's happening across the curriculum. So it's in the obvious place, the program in environmental studies uh, and geosciences, for example. But you will find, for example, now positions in the art department uh, that are focusing courses on this work, or uh, certainly in the history department or uh, sociology, from just to, you know, obviously political science, all kinds of um, areas of the college. And the number of students interested in this arena have uh, increased substantially, majors for sure, but also um, I mentioned the MYSTIC program before. Remote learning allowed a, a whole large number of students to take courses on oceans and environments from the MYSTIC faculty uh, last year. Um, and so that we saw a really uh, a great student increase in this area. Um, so when I talk about, for example, the digital humanities uh, and the arts, uh, there is really an interest in bringing integrative arts and science together. Uh, and um, I urge any of you who get to campus um, during a semester to pop into the art museum uh, to their lab uh, in the front area where they put all the art that students are using in classes. And you, know, you won't be surprised to find the art history classes represented there. But if you round the bend, you'll see the environmental studies uh, courses and the art they're drawing on, the chemistry department, the biology department, um, and many of those do have an environmental or climate focused uh, set of interests, but not exclusively. There are other things too. So it is it is really exciting, I think, to think about um, uh, that interdisciplinary learning and then to apply um, uh, you know, digital visualization and all the things that that uh, can come with it as we go forward. And I should say, actually, Kate, okay, one last thing I'll say about this. Winter study before COVID, uh, we had an initiative where um, STEM-based faculty here on campus were training humanists on campus on how to think about um, data and using data in their courses uh, in interesting and novel ways. So that's another way we're using our liberal arts culture is for educators to train educators. That's great. I will say to the many, many people who still have questions unanswered, we're doing, Maud's giving great answers. We're doing our best to get, get to all of you, but we may not. And loquacious uh, as ever, so. Yes, no, it's it's all good. Uh, the Committee on Diversity and Community, I know has done a, perhaps a significant amount of work, but has ongoing work in the area of institutional history. Um, and so one question asker says, um, you know, last year the the record reported that Ephraim Williams had owned slaves, but there's there's been little follow up that this person has heard, and have there been any developments in the college to think about and look at that history? Yeah, actually, so. Um... The first thing I would suggest is folks read the Committee on Diversity and Community Report, which is on the webpage uh, of that committee. 
and you can read the very long list of recommendations that came out of that committee that included, we already touched on um, uh, the topic of native and indigenous populations, but also included recommendations for how Williams should engage in um, all aspects of its history from uh, the question of slavery to the question of um, colonization, uh, uh, particularly around uh, Hawaii, which has come up and also uh, in the space that we um, already talked about. Um, there are lots of recommendations in the report. It was a very long report. A lot of them are very good. Um, it's gonna take me some time to, to build out on all of them or figure out how to address sort of the core themes that come out of there. Um, but I do think we'll, we'll ultimately move forward with um, some kind of uh, public his, uh, humanities or historical work where we can fold uh, under that um, in greater um, engagement and visibility around all of these parts of William's history, some of which were in this question and some of which were in other questions. Um, but you, you'll you'll see if you look at that report that um, that it's 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 multifaceted. There are many areas that it it makes suggestions about, and this this piece just being one. So we will continue to move that work forward. It's part of the strategic plan, actually, that we think about how to um, do a better job telling Williams' uh, history. We teach critical history at Williams, um, and we should be able to use the, I'm a historian, as many of you know, um, and so we wanna use the skills uh, and talents of historians and historical ways of approaching um, the world that we teach our students to also engage with our own history. Uh, and that will be ongoing work over the next many years. That's great. Um, the next questions are about food. So it, as related to sort of current state of affairs on campus and maybe yeah. specific fixes the college is thinking about, but then more long term and related to sustainability and okay. how the college is thinking about, you know, veganism, vegan offerings, kind of its impact, I think, more in a broader sense around how it feeds. Yeah. Them. So so. The, these questions are probably coming from rather different sides of our, our of our questioners. So um, one of the things we're trying to we're trying to do is be as transparent as possible uh, about how to address some of the challenges we face this year. I hope it's getting better. It feels to me I've eaten in the dining halls twice myself, both times uh, that I was there. Um, I just show up like anybody else and stand in line and sort of get the full experience. Um, and uh, I, I, I was encouraged the two times I went at full mealtime that um, some of the things that I was hearing about had reduced uh, thanks to some of the efforts of our amazing dining hall uh, leadership and staff who have been working really hard to listen to what they're hearing and try to make changes given some of the structural realities I mentioned before. They're just, it, it is, and, and um, this isn't gonna make anybody happy who's listening, but I can tell you, I talk regularly to presidents at multiple types of institutions across the Northeast and we all have the same problem. Um, it plays out in different ways with different intensity in different moments, but uh, there, the supply line problem and the hiring problem is larger than Williams which doesn't mean we shouldn't deal with it. We're obviously getting food into students is crucial. Uh, and so we are continuing to try to make changes to, to, to shorten those lines uh, and to um, expand offerings in uh, other times of day. I know where students are looking for that to the extent that's possible. Um, I, I will say having gone to the dining hall um, for the first time, I didn't go last year because it was all grab and go and faculty and staff were not allowed in, in the dining hall. Um, but I went a lot in the prior year and you know it's a big change. There's no question that both um, trying to keep um, students safe and in the space coupled with the structural problems that I've described um, means there's fewer options than there used to be. Uh, and it is, if what you were used to was the copious choice that came with um, pre-COVID, uh, that's that's not true. I don't believe that will be not true forever. I do think this is a problem that will diminish uh, over time, and we are trying to target specific problems that we've heard about. We expanded um, offerings and mission, for example. We uh, changed the with the flow of the buffet line with the hope that uh, the food lines uh, that it would affect uh, wait times, which I think it has, um, and other kinds of changes like that. So it's it's front of mind at front, and um, I would think it's. I think it's safe to say dining is working around the clock to continue to try to uh, address these issues. 
Um, in terms of sustainability uh, in the food, one of the wonderful things about our director of dining, um, when we hired in that space, we were looking for somebody who had, was um, deeply attuned to questions of sustainability. Um, and he has been a wonderful partner with the head of the Zilka Center and with our facilities folks. We're, we're really trying to um, wind um, capacity uh, in these areas, both in the sustainability area and in the um, DEIA space, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, so that it's not just one office that's in charge of this work or um, we're expected to do it, but rather that the capacity as we hire is deep across uh, the campus. So food and dining is one of the areas where they've done a lot of work in this space. Um, and uh, I encourage everybody in, in a couple of weeks in mid-October, the Provost Duke's Lab will put out a letter describing all the things we're doing in the sustainability space, including in the area that you asked about. And there'll be a lot of details in there. The strategic plan also speaks to it. Um, uh, but there is work on you know small the smallest things from switching our coffee machines to compostable um, coffee pods uh, in uh, throughout the college uh, to much larger initiatives around the food containers that students use um, uh, to, to take to-go food, for example, and, and many other initiatives beside, and the Zilka Center partners, as I say, with, with in, um, offices all over campus, and we will continue to, to do more and more in that space if we can. Thanks. Okay, we are coming up against time, but just one one last question, and this is sure. forward looking. Um, a parent asked, how can we help support sourcing internships, mentoring students if we're not alumni? Mm -hmm. um, and, Thank you. and I think that's a great question. And that is a great question. And, and I'm so grateful. Uh, so many times when I uh, meet with uh, alumni and parents, somebody will ask, how can we help, which is, you know, I've said it before, so you've heard me say it before, but it is quite moving in my role to have so many people care so much about supporting uh, students. So, um, so parents can absolutely uh, provide internship opportunities for Williams students through the Center for uh, Career Exploration. Um, I am quite sure the director um, would be happy to hear from you uh, and help you post positions in Handshake, which is our platform that uh, provides those opportunities to students and makes clear how they apply for them. Um, and there are other ways parents can be involved with that center, uh, including in, in the kind of mentoring roles I mentioned. And in um, we like to bring folks in who have had interesting career paths just to talk to students, kind of how did you, how did you become you? There's a real name for that program and that isn't it. But I don't remember the actual name of the program, but it is a program where we bring alumni and, and parents to, um, to, to talk about in your own pathway. Most of our paths have been pretty circuitous um, and it's, in, I think, very in, interesting and important for students to learn about networking, uh, taking a step forward, walking through an open door, all the things that, that many of you have learned in your professional lives that you can share with students. So there's lots of ways you can do this um, and we do really appreciate it. it is, really meaningful for our students and sub-communities of our students, first-generation students, affinity, various affinity groups who are looking for models uh, for how to be successful out of, after college. Um, and so uh, those kinds of opportunities are, are deeply meaningful as well. Um, and we, I thank you in advance for any engagement in that space. Thanks, Maud. So we've we've answered more than two dozen questions in that 40 minute time that you had, which is remarkable. Thank you. Um, it's always good to see you and, and great Thank to you. have you. I am so sorry to those of you who joined us and we didn't get to your questions, but you'll have to come back next time and keep asking. Keep uh, asking. And there are certainly people on campus that you can reach out to as well. Um, but thanks for coming. Thank you, Maude, for all the sure. work you're continuing to do. It's it's amazing to watch how Williams is balancing this focus on community, well-being, excellence in academics. I mean, you're you're doing a lot and doing it so well. But in these hard times, I know it takes even more energy um, and more focus. Well, I appreciate well, that. You know, and I mean it. And I and I'm going to put a plug in for anybody who is an alumnus who's with us today to say that if you haven't had a chance to engage in any of our bicentennial offerings that you take the last couple of months to, to see what we have and what we've done and, and engage. And Maude has been an unbelievable supporter of alumni. I love that we're in her strategic plan. Uh, and so um, we hope that you'll continue to join us for these talks and everything else that Williams is doing and hopefully on campus too, um, eventually. So thank you. Wonderful. Thanks everybody. Great to see you.